Today, we have a potential new entrant to the ACO market here in Vermont. Um, it's incredibly important that Vermont attracts interest uh, from providers and ACOs, and we're excited to hear from uh, Gather Healthcare today. Um, that being said, we have a rigorous and important review process, and that is what we will go through today. Um, I'll note for the record that there's no executive director report this morning. Um, that'll be provided uh, on Wednesday at our board meeting at 1 p.m. Um, first, I'd like to go to the meeting minutes of October 12th, 2022. Uh, is there a motion to approve the minutes from October 12th, 2022? So moved. And is there a second? second. I'll second. Great. Thank you. <clears throat> is there any board discussion? Hearing none, uh, those in favor of approval of the minutes of October 12th, 2022, please say aye. 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 Uh, the vote was unanimous. Um, I'm sorry, is there any uh, uh, nays? All right, hearing none, the vote was unanimous and the minutes are approved. Prior to turning to the folks from Gather, I'd like to pass it over to Marissa Melamed, who is going to provide an overview of our ACO review process. Marissa. Great. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Foster and members of, of the board and uh, Gather Health. My name is Marissa Melamed. I'm Associate Director of Health Systems Policy for the Green Mountain Care Board, um, and I uh, direct the ACO oversight process. I have with me this morning give you an introduction, um, Russ McCracken, uh, staff attorney, and Julia Bowles. Uh, Julia is going to kick off uh, with a few introductory slides and some background before we turn it over to the gather folks. You can go ahead, Julia. Great, and can someone just nod their head to confirm that you can see the slides? Great, thank you. Um, so we just have a couple introductory slides, as Marissa said. Um, this one should look familiar to the board, but with some highlights to orient us about what we're focusing on today. Um, so Gather Health, the ACO we're hearing from today is a Medicare-only ACO, meaning that we're looking at the right-hand side of this flowchart. And because they're Medicare-only, they're not subject to the certification process and are only going through the budget review, highlighted again on the right. Um, and underneath that, because Gather Health has fewer than 10,000 attributed lives in Vermont, the review is based on standards and processes the GMCB deems appropriate whereas larger ACOs would be subject to all standards established under Rule 5. Um, and finally, as highlighted in the bottom green box, the GMCB has developed Medicare-only guidance earlier this year um, for ACOs with fewer than 10,000 lives, and that is the guidance that is the basis for today's review. Um, so I will hand it to Russ to kind of get us into the details further. Uh, great. Thanks, Julia. And uh, I am going to keep this quick because I don't expect the board will be you know, discussing um, this is, will be really held for another day for deliberation. Um, but to frame the hearing and the questions today, I think it's important to remember what the board's approving here. Uh, for a Medicare-only ACO like Gather Health, certification is not required by statute. Um, by statute, all that is required is for the PMCB to review and approve or modify the ACO's budget. Uh, and as Julia just sketched out, um, Gather falls into the category of ACOs with fewer than 10,000 attributed lives in Vermont. Uh, so that gives the board a little bit of flexibility in determining which statutory criteria are applicable or appropriate to review in connection with uh, Gather Health. Um, also note that uh, Gather Health as an ACO operating in Vermont is subject to other reporting obligations that are captured under Rule 5, uh, 501. So uh, next slide, please. Uh, so for the budget review process, there are, I think, 16 different criteria listed in statute. What we've done here is pulled out, uh, I believe, eight of them that we think would be appropriate for an ACO that is participating in Medicare only and with a, a smaller size um, like what Gather has. These criteria may look familiar to some members of the board because they're the criteria that were used uh, the last time the board reviewed 
the budget for a Medicare only ACO. Uh, so I'll, I'll run through them. Um, the criteria that you don't see here that are in statute, um, the general rationale that we followed is those other criteria that we, we haven't listed um, really apply to an ACO that has more of a statewide scope or uh, a larger presence in Vermont. They talk more about systemic investment. Uh, they talk more about um, aligning statewide with um, you know, different state, statewide needs. So what we have uh, highlighted here are um, any benchmark, sorry, uh, not quite on the slide. Any benchmarks under 5402? Uh, yeah, no, I'm sorry, Julia, you're right. Next slide. Um, so here, here are the criteria. Um, is information regarding utilization uh, of healthcare services um, delivered by providers participating in the ACO. I want to think about character, competence, fiscal responsibility, and soundness of the ACO and its principles. Uh, any reports that are available from professional review organizations related to the, the ACO. Um, uh, the, any efforts the ACO is making to prevent duplication of high quality service um, and make sure that services are being provided efficiently and effectively uh, to the extent possible utilizing existing um, providers. Uh, and next slide. Um, public comment is an important part of the board's regulatory process and, and uh, so the Will be an opportunity today for that, and the board uh, welcomes and appreciates public comment. Um, and the board will also consider the information gathered from this meeting and um, any other uh, staff meetings that we've had with the ACO. Information on the ACO's administrative cost, um, the extent to which the ACO makes its cost transparent and easy to understand, uh, and the extent to which ACO provides resources to primary care practices. Uh, to ensure that care coordination and community service, uh, including mental health and substance use disorder counseling, um, can be provided without uh, unreasonable burdens on primary care um, to the extent that that is applicable to GATHER's uh, healthcare model. Uh, and I will then turn it back to Julia to go through uh, sort of the broad timeline and um, the uh, a couple notes on the agenda for today. Great. Yeah, thank you, Russ. Um, so this slide just has a quick reminder of the timeline for this overall process. Um, today, of course, we are having the budget hearing for Gather Health. Next week on Wednesday, November 2nd, the GMCD staff will be presenting our analysis of Gather Health's FY23 budget to the board, including our recommendations. And finally, there's a potential vote scheduled for November 16th. Um, and as Russ just covered briefly, we wanted to reiterate the importance of public comment. Um, you can give public comment later today in this meeting, but also we always welcome it online via our website. Um, there's a couple key deadlines that we've outlined here just to help make sure that the staff and the board have time to consider the comments. Um, so we ask that public comment be submitted by Friday, October 28th, in order to be considered ahead of the staff analysis presentation for Friday, November 11th to be considered ahead of the potential vote. And finally, um, we wanted to just show the agenda for today. So Marissa, Russ and I have just gone over the GMCB's authority and criteria, as well as the timeline and public comment. Next, we will hear from Gather Health. Then there will be board questions, um, questions from the healthcare advocate, public comment, and an executive session if needed. Um, so as a reminder, parts of Gather's submission are marked confidential, so discussion of confidential information should be held for a potential executive session if the board desires. Um, and with that, I'm happy to pass it back to you, Chair Foster, or we can go right to Russ to swear in the witnesses and start the presentation. Yeah, please, please swear the witnesses. Great, thank you. Um, <clears throat> for Gather Health, I, I believe it's... Um, Mark and Mark who are presenting today, is that right? Anybody else joining you? We also have, uh, good Good morning everyone, I'm Mark Breesocker. Uh, Russ, we also have um, Andrew uh, Tsu on uh, with us. Uh, he is uh, advising us from a, a legal counsel perspective. 
Okay, that's great. Um, I don't need to swear him in as uh, as attorney. Um, so it would just be uh, you, Mark, and Mark, if you uh, don't mind, if you would raise your right hand, and do you solemnly swear or affirm that the evidence you shall give relative to the cause now under consideration shall be the whole truth and nothing but the truth? I do. I do. Great. Thanks very much. And I will then uh, turn it directly over to you um, to share your slides and uh, start the presentation. Great. Thank you all uh, very much. So again, I'm, I'm Mark Breesocker. Good morning. Um, thank you very much for uh, having us uh, join you today to present our uh, Medicare Shared Savings uh, Accountable Care Organization. We're, we, we are Gather Health. Um, we are a new entrant ACO, and we're really, we're really excited about uh, what we are endeavoring to do, and we're very excited about our, uh, about our partnership with, with North Star Health, a federally qualified health center um, in the state of Vermont. Um, I'm Mark Breesocker. Uh, I'm, I'm a general pediatrician. I um, um, grew up in the Midwest, trained out in Salt Lake City, Utah, at the University of Utah, and ended up staying in, in Utah and uh, practiced general pediatrics for 15 years for a large integrated health system uh, located in that state. Um, I, I held a, a series of leadership positions, physician leadership positions during that time, um, and served served on the board of that health system's wholly owned insurance company uh, for um, about 14 years. And I, you know, over the 26 years I, I, I uh, worked for that health system and, and insurance company, I had the opportunity to um, see a lot of different things in terms of innovations in healthcare. Uh, my main interest as a primary care physician was always around the, the advancement of, of creating an environment where people can get the best care possible, that they can really realize uh, to the fullest fullest extent their health, their well-being, uh, and how, how could we as physicians and providers and clinical teams and, and also as a health system or insurance company do our very best to serve them. Um, I joined Gather Health uh, this year as we formed this uh, the company and we we embarked upon this journey to be an ACO and we're really looking forward to sharing more about that ACO this morning. Uh, I want to hand things over to Mark Atala, Mark, for for your introduction, and then um, and then we'll jump into the into the uh, uh, presentation. So, Mark, over to you. Thanks so much, Mark. And can everyone see my screen? Perfect. Yeah, but um, Mark, I assume you see yourself, so I'll minimize that. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, and, and thanks for having us, uh, Chair Foster, uh, the board, and uh, all the Green Mountain Care Board staff that have been great to work with so far. Um, my name is Mark Atal. I'm a pharmacist. I uh, most recently was a senior advisor to the CMS administrator uh, for all of drug pricing and uh, innovation. Um, prior to that, I was at the CMS Innovation Center. Uh, and I led our Medicare Advantage and Part D work, uh, as, as well as um, working through financials of the Next Generation ACO program. Um, and so I'm uh, hopefully familiar with a, a bit of these programs. Uh, today, uh, in terms of agenda, we wanted to touch quickly on the Shared Savings Program, a little bit of history, the, the statutes and, and regulations that uh, were held to uh, as, far, as part of being um, an SSP ACO, uh, really how, how the quality performance is, is set and then that, how that ties into the ACO's uh, finances and, and savings and losses. Um, I'll then hand it over to, to Mark for the ACO background and care model, uh, and then also budget um, financial model discussions, and then um, happy to hand it back to the board uh, for, for questions. Does that, does that work for everyone? Any, any differences of order? Okay, and I'll apologize. The, okay, I'm sorry. I apologize for being monotone and uh, any dryness of this presentation. It's hard to, to really amp up the shared savings program, but I'll do I'll do my best. So, uh, in the Affordable Care Act, uh, there was a a desire to, to say we have a lot of patients that are fee for service uh, and beneficiaries that are entitled to Medicare. They're entitled to Medicare for the rest of their 
their lives. Um, and, and we think we can do better to manage those patients. And so uh, uh, part of the uh, Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act was cr the, the statutory creation of the Medicare Shared Savings Program, which we'll cite um, shortly. Uh, this has been the evolution of that program. Um, so, you know, really started off uh, as expected, you know, smaller. It's now uh, about 11 million beneficiaries. And so when we look at the combination of uh, the Affordable Care Act also created the Innovation Center, the CMS Innovation Center. They also run uh, value-based total cost of care, uh, ACO models. Uh, I think the, the one that you've, you've probably been most familiar with is direct contracting, which has been rebranded re the ACO reach model. Um, the combination of the you know, SSP plus ACO reach covers about 11.4 million beneficiaries, uh, which leaves about, you know, 25 million or so beneficiaries that are not in a value-based care model. Um, and then I would think about the other set of patients that are in, in, in Medicare Advantage or, or PACE or another uh, you know, cost-based uh, plan. And, and so that, that's the entirety of, of Medicare today. And so as we think about the Shared Savings Program, it, it's the largest of uh, really any program CMS is running. Um, there's about 483 ACOs in, in SSP this year. Um, and as you can see, it, it's been it's been successful um, relative to uh, you know, previous years in terms of in terms of generating true savings for the for the system, and then also ensuring quality is met. And so so that's how the program's evolved over time. Um, just to hit on a few key points of 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 the program, um, again, uh, Congress uh, enacted the program to to really say we need someone to be accountable. Um, for for a patient population to really coordinate care, uh, build infrastructure, and redesign care processes to ensure um, beneficiaries receive high quality and efficient um, care. And so, to, to to start moving to the regs, uh, everything's found at uh, 42 Code of Federal Regulations. Uh, this is Section uh, 425. Uh, essentially, an ACO is it's a legal entity establishes contractual arrangements with uh, providers. Um, and then uh, as part of those providers uh, seeing Medicare fee-for-service beneficiaries, uh, they're assigned to the ACO either through a claims-based process, which is the majority of assignments, uh, and then there's also a voluntary alignment option. Um, you know, to ensure that a benchmark is uh, mathematically or statistically valid, uh, you know, an ACO SSP program uh, needs at least 5,000 beneficiaries. And then to ensure that the ACO really is run by the providers that it, that, um, that these patients have chosen to see, uh, the, the governing body of the ACO must be comprised really of of that uh, of that set of, of providers. And so, at least seventy five percent of the um, of the voting shares of, of the ACO's governing body uh, is held by the providers that that comprise the ACO, and then also the Medicare beneficiary. Um, the ACO's leadership certainly is part of the governing body, but may or may not have uh, voting a share. Uh, further, there's a compliance officer for the ACO, in this case, it's me, uh, who reports directly to the governing body. Um, there's also, in terms of leadership management, an ACO executive director, uh, that's Dr. Breesocker, a senior medical director, quality, someone who, and then someone that really handles quality assurance and, and compliance. Um, it's a five year agreement with CMS. And then, as far as insurance or as far as a financial guarantee, um, because there's not a change to the person's insurance, so the beneficiary um, still maintains 100% of their Medicare uh, benefit, they're entitled to that, there's, there's no change there. All finances still go between CMS and the provider. So the provider will bill CMS, uh, CMS will pay that provider 100% um, of whatever the uh, CMS rate is for, the, for, the, for that provider uh, and for that claim. And then, and that's not changing. What really changes is at the end of the year, uh, which we'll get into at the end, um, there's really a spreadsheet calculation to say, here's what CMS believes we should have paid for this set of patients or beneficiary. Here's what we did pay, um, you know, how are the quality metrics hit? And if there's savings after that, um, CMS shares those savings. If there's losses, uh, the, the ACO is responsible for um, paying back uh, CMS what the delta is between expected costs for that population and quality assurances and then, and then what what actually was performed. 
Um, and I'll pause that. I can pause this either at each slide or feel free to interject whenever the board has questions. Um, as part of this, again, because uh, Medicare is an entitlement and a benefit, um, really there needs to be, from CMS's perspective and, and also ours, uh, you know, transparency and public reporting, uh, marketing needs to be clear uh, and, and regulated. There need to be a, a strong set of beneficiary protections, and then the ACO must you know, maintain audit um, record records to be audited. And so, in order to operate as an ACO in, in the shared savings program, at least um, beneficiaries have to be aware, you know, through signs in the providers' offices, uh, written notices that that this participant or this provider is part of the SSP. The beneficiary may you know, opt out of data sharing if they so choose. The ACO maintains a public website. That website maintains information that CMS outlines. Uh, the ACO must have um, all marketing that, that the ACO creates to ensure beneficiaries are aware of the extra benefits um, or, or ways that the ACO can help the beneficiary. Uh, you know, it's filed with CMS, and CMS has um, you know, ultimate approval authority to, to ensure that Nothing's confusing to a beneficiary or, or, or may uh, negatively impact the beneficiary's uh, use of their Medicare benefit. Um, again, uh, CMS, HHS, and OIG, as well as other federal regulatory agencies, uh, can always audit, inspect, investigate, and evaluate the ACO or the ACO participants' uh, operation of the ACO uh, really at any time. And then, you know, to ensure an ACO is compliant, uh, ACOs are required to have a, co a compliance policy and then also a plan. And those plans really are you know, to ensure that the compliance of officer or official is not the attorney for the ACO. Uh, and then really has uh, the, 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 there, there's a robust compliance process in place to ensure uh, you know, everyone's aware of, of what's required. And if something is amiss, that there's a process to, to report that. Um, in terms of, of care model, and then payment rule waivers, and this maybe addresses a few of the questions um, the board staff have, have asked. Uh, so, so first, the the ACO really is designed and, and fully incented to to ensure that evidence based medicine is practiced, um, and that patients are are engaged. That there's um, shared decision making in terms of uh, choices of care and decisions on care. Uh, that care transitions uh, are implemented, and we'll we'll talk more about that. Uh, Later in the presentation, um, th there's also a, you know assessment um, of you know what beneficiaries' uh, level of care and experience of care was, and that's that's part of this. ACOs are allowed to provide beneficiary incentives uh, as as one lever to ensure that um, if an ACO believes there's an option uh, for better care, if something is not covered by Medicare, uh, the ACO can pay for that. So that that's dollars that are not provided by CMS. It's that's the ACO's investment. In those in, in those beneficiaries' care, uh, as long as those, the, the incentives are, are really preventive care or do advance a clinical goal for that beneficiary and are connected to that person's um, care, there's the option for so in terms of payment rule waivers. So what is Medicare waived for for ACOs that are part of the shared savings program? Um, if you apply, and so these are all, these are really optional waivers. Uh, the ACO uh, can apply to waive the rule that, that says before a, a, a sniff stay, um, you need a, you're required to have a three-day inpatient stay in the hospital. Uh, that's that's one option. There's a set of requirements around that. Uh, we we did not opt uh, for this waiver this year. Um, there's also a telehealth waiver essentially to allow the the home as an originating site, given the use of of telehealth during the public health emergency. Um, this is already part of uh, part of care, and so we we didn't. It's a little bit of uh, overcome by events, so we we didn't have a need uh, to, to to apply for that waiver either. Um, in terms of how all of this then plays into the financial performance, the ACOs are are held to two things: um, either uh, a set of quality measures that are um, uh, deemed by CMS, uh, terms of web interface measures, uh, or or um, really a there's three what's called electronic uh, clinical quality measures or, or MIPS quality measures. And then secondly, a survey of patient experience. So that's what the CAPS uh, indicates. Um, and so the, that's the set of you know, how, how did this ACO perform uh, per CMS. And so in order to qualify for shared savings, um, the ACO must meet that, that standard on those uh, two things. Um, 
And then based on how the ACO performs on those two things, the in the event that the ACO has losses, um, it, this really the performance on your quality, um, uh, your quality performance indicates uh, what level of, of losses uh, the ACO pays back to the uh, to the program, and which which you know, should make sense. The ACO that isn't doing well in quality, uh, if they have losses, they you know, they, they pay back uh, the most that that CMS um, lists in terms of, of downside risk. So then then the question is how, how much risk, um, and again this is really spreadsheet risk. Uh, does a does an ACO hold? Um, so first there's a question of uh, you know, what level of minimum savings or minimum loss rate the ACO chooses. And so the ACO can choose um, in the event of the enhanced track, they can choose anywhere from zero to 2% uh, um, of an MSR or MMLR, which means essentially for the first 2%, let's say I choose 2%, two, 2 for the first 2% uh, of savings or losses, uh, no money is changing hands. And so, you know, ACO ends up in 1.5% losses they wouldn't pay anything because they're within their their rate. Um, there are some plan. There are some tracks, as you can see here, that have upside risk only. Um, those those ACOs are then forced into a higher higher levels of risk over time. Um, the enhanced track, which is what we are, uh, is, is on the far right, um, and and has the greatest set of you know, financial incentives to to ensure that the ACO is trying to uh, impact uh, positive care for beneficiaries. Um, again, I think it's important to note the the relationship between a CMS and providers uh, it stays the exact same. The only positive, the only change here is, is that, frankly, uh, is only positive for beneficiaries. There, there's there's a incentive clearly from everything we just outlined uh, to ensure that beneficiaries, you know, stay healthier and and, and are healthier, uh, and to incentivize really high quality care management, which is uh, what we can talk through. Next, Mark, I can hand it to you if that works. That's great. Before I proceed, thank you, Mark. Before I proceed, does the board have any questions about the Medicare State Save, Save, Shared Savings Program and the background that Mark Atala provided? Oh, thank you. Okay, great. Th thank you so much. So, uh, a little bit about um, our ACO background. So. Um, 2023 will be our first performance year. As Mark mentioned, we are in, in the enhanced track. Our main intervention it, with our ACO is addressing chronic disease through lifestyle medicine. And uh, we spent the spring and summer talking to groups and providers across the country who have an interest in lifestyle medicine and uh, sharing with them our ideas around forming this ACO. And from those conversations, we uh, uh, entered into contracts with providers uh, from the six states that you see listed there. Um, Mark Atal has talked about the assignment methodology and the waivers being used. Um, we do we have formed a board. 80% um, of those uh, of the uh, of the board are ACO participants. So these are providers in the different groups across the country that uh, primary care providers who are, are uh, and some medical specialists that are part of our ACO that uh, will serve on our board and that the leadership team is accountable to uh, for execution of our program and our interventions, quality reporting, uh, the services we're providing uh, to uh, Medicare beneficiaries across uh, the six states that we serve. Um, we uh, also have two consumer advocates, and as, uh, when we receive our list of attributed uh, people on Medicare to our ACO uh, in December, we'll then be working to add a uh, Medicare beneficiary who is served by the ACO to our board membership, governing body membership. We've elected a minimum savings or loss rate of 0.5%, so in that 0 to 2% range, um, uh, in the enhanced track, which is the highest uh, um, highest uh, uh, upside and downside risk uh, uh, model in the ACO, uh, we've chosen that 0.5% as the the minimum savings. So let's what what is our care model? Um, our care model is you know starts with the fact that that 
as as a population overall across the United States, we have been on a trend of, of, of rising chronic diseases. And there have been many programs uh, in at, at state levels, at health systems levels, at academic medical centers, in private practice, people really leaning into providing the best care possible uh, across these many years, and yet we continue to see increases in chronic diseases. So our, our belief and our main intervention is, number one, we want to keep doing all those programs uh, that are working. So the programs that a, that a particular clinic has, a program that a hospital system in a, in a given uh, region or state has, we should definitely keep doing all those things, the, the things that are adding value. We also want to intervene at the root causes of chronic disease. Um, you know, it's it, amongst Medicare beneficiaries, 25% of everyone on Medicare today has type 2 diabetes. Another 4% have type 2 diabetes, but they've not been diagnosed yet. And another 50% have prediabetes. So we aim to begin to address this and addressing it by creating a community and bringing that community together across our ACO so that the people that we serve have information, they have a connection to each other, they have the ability to ask questions and support each other and try even the smallest things and work on the smallest things to uh, improve their health and address either their risk factors for chronic disease or better manage the chronic diseases that they have. We also know that that people when they do get sick need a lot of support. And so we aim to create additional awareness for our provider groups across the country about where their patients are. So who's been seen in the emergency department recently, who's been admitted to the hospital, who's being discharged to a skilled nursing facility. And so when we provide that, that information and that awareness of, of where are their patients getting care from, um, they are then able to apply care management interventions, transition of care support to uh, make sure that, that those patients receive the best care possible as they recover from their illness. We will be uh, also tracking on on those that have multiple chronic conditions and high needs. Um, that also must happen within partner with great partnership with our local providers. We a kind of a, a key guiding principle um, that, that we talk about is that it really it's the people that are closest to the patient care that knows their population the best. And so what we want to do is provide the information and resources to them with choice so that both patients that we serve as well as the clinical teams that are part of the ACO can take the, the additional resource that the ACO provides in terms of information and financial support to intervene in the best way possible for that individual patient or for that group of patients being served in the community. And lastly, um, we really believe that it's important to know the uh, that, that people have services when they're very sick and that it's very important to know uh, what each which each person's wishes are as they they manage through an illness. And so we uh, will be focusing on services around palliative care, hospice care, uh, and other related things uh, as people uh, are, are managing the full scope and process of, of, of their lives and, um, and the, the uh, medical care that they're receiving as part of that. So if you go to the next slide, um, this is a summary of our budget and financial model. Um, I'll quickly walk through this um, and, and hit the highlights. The first, the first three rows really just gives you gives the total scope of the Medicare funds that are going to be flowing through the ACO as it relates to the 5,000 traditional Medicare fee-for-service beneficiaries that we uh, expect will be attributed from through North Star Health uh, and the providers at the, those federally qualified health center clinics. The benchmark uh, that um, is estimated at this point, we, we will we'll receive a final benchmark uh, in December 
Um, you can see there's $9,900 per beneficiary. So that's how you get to the total um, project amount of Medicare billing and our total benchmark for this group of patients. We then uh, consider um, a, a, and project, you know, a different three different models of shared savings, one at 3% of savings that we, we generate, uh, a second level at 5%, and then um, uh, seven percent is the third level. Just uh, for for awareness, the the average amount of shared savings in a Medicare shared uh, a Medicare shared savings program ACO is three point five percent. So uh, uh, that means that of the total amount that forty nine million five hundred thousand dollars. First of all, assuming a five percent uh, shared savings. You know, the vast majority of that, 95%, the 47 million plus, continues to flow to hospitals and clinics and, and providers in Vermont that, that are serving patients today. Then importantly, of the of the 5% net shared savings, the, the 2,475,000, uh, over 80% of that will go back to Vermont beneficiaries, Vermont providers in the form of in-kind incentives, care management support, and, sh and additional shared savings with Vermont providers. We estimate uh, operating expenses of just shy of uh, two, uh, a quarter million, so 225,000, leaving net shared savings retained by the ACO uh, of $255,000. And then there's some percentages at the very end there that shows just overall uh, of all the dollars flowing through the programs where uh, what percent stays with Vermont beneficiaries and providers and uh, the percent of the total that, that is expenses for us and the percent that's a total of shared savings retained by us. Mark, just one, one quick um, correction for the record. So, so we'll receive a final benchmark actually in um, expected uh, second half or July of 2024 um, for, for for the actual the actual year. So um, if that helps. Yeah. Thank you. So oh. yeah. So we we have an estimated benchmark that we'll be aiming for, um, but the but the final actual benchmark that that is that is uh, what we'll receive uh, from Medicare uh, once there's been uh, all the run out of claims and uh, all, all all things have been reconciled. Uh, after the performance year during 2023. So that final benchmark is then 2024. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. So we've had a chance to review uh, information about Medicare shared saving program overall. Uh, we've uh, shared our model of care and uh, um, that, that, that we're focused on lifestyle medicine as a key intervention and, and then shared uh, our, our financial uh, plan. So thank you again for this time and, and we are uh, looking forward to your questions and, and the discussion and, and we'll hand it back to, to the staff to facilitate that. Um, thank you, Mr. Breesiker and Mr. Atala. Um, at this time, um, I'll note I have a few questions myself, um, some that pertain to information uh, gathers designated as confidential and others that are um, not. Um, but I'll turn it over to my fellow board members for any questions or comments. Thank you. I'll go ahead and start uh, if that works for you, Mr. Chair. Please. Great. Uh, hi, um, I'm Robin Lunge. Uh, I've been on the board for six years now, so nice to meet you all. Um, so I have a few questions and I thought I'd start with a uh, follow up on the care model. Um, in your discussion of the care model, you talk about creating a community. Are you expecting that the community is a virtual community, an in-person community, some of each? Could you just give us a little more information about that? Yes, uh, thank you, Robin. It's nice to meet you. So uh, the answer is uh, yes to both. So, so um, of course, people will continue to have their in-person community, so family and friends and, and those around them that are, uh, which is so important. Uh, um, in, when receiving medical care. Um, additionally, though, we will create a virtual community, a community of people that uh, can connect with each other with questions. Um, they can 
they can share their experiences. It really is based on the on the this idea that the the, the com your community overall is your caregiver. Now that might that sometimes you know as a as a physician I'm like wait wait a second I'm 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 the primary care doctor, and that's true. But the reality is that I I'm one part of of a community, and I think that's something especially as a pediatrician where there there was always a whole bunch of people in the room. In fact, from my perspective, the more people in the room together, I loved it when grandma and grandpa came to visits uh, and would ask questions. Be and it just reinforced that it really takes everyone around you to, to care for someone, whether that's in, in raising a child or caring for, for uh, a, a friend or a family uh, loved one. So providers are part of that community and we have our expertise. But, um, you know, I, I think that's someone who has type 2 diabetes and high blood pressure and has been living with that and actually doing a really great job, they have that practical and pragmatic expertise and that's what needs to be shared. And it's and, and the interesting thing about lifestyle medicine interventions is that it, it, it starts with just one small step, just, just a person saying, I'm gonna try something pretty straightforward that, that I've seen others be able to do and, they, and they've shared some of the ways that they that they made that happen. And that information, that idea, that idea can spread through a community. And before you know it, it's it's just who we are and what we do. And it's our, those are our traditions. And so that's uh, that's the model that that we want to leverage. And maybe one other point I would make that is that this is a model that where it's super important to have great partnerships with providers but we're not as dependent on 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 the provider care. We want them to do their thing, keep doing that. But this community can can sit right next to that to that uh, the, to the clinics and the hospitals and the care that's being provided, and and be additional and additive to uh, to that care that that's taking place. Thank you. Um, uh one of the other questions I had was related to the in-kind incentives. Is there sort of a standard suite of in-kind incentives that you anticipate offering your providers um, in multiple states, or is that something that you leave to the individual provider office? Could you just speak a little bit more to um, how that will be designed and give us some examples of what in-kind incentives uh, might be? Sure. So um, in the regulations, the in-kind incentives um, are, are focused on those that we provide to uh, the Medicare beneficiary. So it is, it really is, uh, it's anything that can help them manage a health condition or prevent, prevent uh, something from happening. So from a lifestyle medicine perspective, what we want to do is provide flexibility to them so that they would be in a position to elect to if, uh, maybe it's uh, purchase groceries that are healthier. Um, they might need help with transportation expenses. Um, and so, so what we want to do, I think the important thing from in, within our model is that we align those incentives with the activities that an individual person is doing uh, to, from a lifestyle intervention perspective. So they're, they're working on, on their health or managing their chronic disease or addressing risk factors for chronic disease. And and that will will be aligned with with the uh, in kind incentives that th that they also receive. The other part, I guess, the other important thing is that we want to provide people with information about how they're doing. So for some, having a Fitbit might be uh, might provide them with some additional feedback and information on how many steps they're walking. And if I'm doing 2,000 steps a day, maybe I could maybe I could do 3,000, and, and that might be the first thing. So what we want to do is make sure people have that type of feedback um, in their in their care and in it, as they try out different ideas to be healthier, so they can know whether or not it's making a difference for them. For from a provider perspective, in our model, we want to provide them with with resources that really honor their knowledge about what their patients need. So um, I guess I, I think the, the key thing in terms of our approach here is flexibility and choice. 
we want individual people on Medicare to have the flexibility and choice for the things that are most important to them. And we want our providers to be able to take the, the information and the reports and the financial resources that we provide to them. And they then can choose how best to apply that to make the biggest difference for the, for their, for the patients that they serve and the community that they serve. Thanks. So um, just to be slightly more concrete, so how would a person sign up for an in-kind incentive? Like presumably they're participating in the online community. Is there like a process? Like how does that actually work? Yeah, so they, they, there is a process to sign up to the community. Um, uh, that is, it, it, there'll be an, an app that they, they can download. We'll, we'll have support for them to work through that process. Um, the um, what, what then happens as they then take on or try different things, uh, for example, just, just downloading the app and signing up is a really positive step. And so based on that, they then would be eligible for, for an in-kind incentive. Um, and they would have some, they would have some choice there in, in deciding uh, how best to apply that. And I, you know, I might be able to go into even more detail um, yeah, with the model, um, you know, when when we move to executive session. Great. Yes. And please, uh, I should have said this at the outset. If anything that I'm asking you kind of goes into that territory, please just indicate, and I will follow up in executive session. Yeah, that's great. I really, I do. I want to share it. I mean, I'm so excited about it. Um, but I, but I also, you know, I think it's be best for there. Thank you. Um, so I wanted to talk about a couple of Vermont programs, which understanding this is a multi-state ACO, I just want to understand how um, you've been thinking about the Vermont specific stuff and, uh, or whether you're kind of deferring that to North Star. And those programs that I wanted to touch on were the Blueprint for Health and uh, SASH, which is Services and Supports at Home, which is a, a program specifically for uh, seniors uh, which started in congregate housing and is looking to provide services at in that congregate housing and also um, Vermont information technology leaders and how you would see your programs complementing um, those programs and whether you as the ACO will be directly interfacing with those entities or whether that would be left to North Star. So, um... The, I'm very familiar with the Vermont Blueprint for Health. I've actually, I've actually been following that for a long time. And um, in my previous roles, um, and many of my leadership roles were in population health. And obviously, as being on the on the board of a health plan, you know, we we thought about how to better serve members and patients uh, in the best way possible all the time. And frankly, the, I mean, I, it's been. It, it's been really important and in, uh, inspiring to see what the state has done and how you know the bold steps that were taken to, in creating the blueprint. And I, you know, early on we, you know, I reviewed the bl blueprint for health again, and and I just saw a lot of alignment um, with what, not only with what we're doing, but why we're doing it. And so, um, I I think that uh, I'm I'm confident that that there'll be a uh, uh, that alignment will continue. I'm not as familiar with SASH. Um, and so uh, with respect to that, I, I do believe that uh, working with the team at North Star Health, which they've been amazing to work with, um, you know, over these past couple months. In fact, we're, we have a meeting with them related to implementation uh, later today, um, one of our regular meetings that are scheduled. And um, we certainly will, uh, once we get the ACO stood up, um, we will dig into that. Um, obviously, it's it's a super important aspect of care. Um, you know, we we saw, you know, we saw, I guess I, I, guess I would say there's a lots of opportunity there to, to be even better um, and 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 to support them. And um, and certainly in when you're managing, you're accountable for, you're partnering uh, around a, the health of a population, understanding long term, you know, the care that's being uh, given in long term care facilities and supporting those facilities and the best care is is really important. Um, 
And then lastly, from a health information technology perspective, um, you, when, when you have uh, an ACO across six states, and I, I think we've got five or six different electronic health records and, and uh, you know, a number of uh, state of health information exchanges, we know that interoperability is super important. And so um, part of our approach is, is we're talking to several companies that, um, that focus on interoperability of, of health information technology so that we can provide um, and connect to people to share the most important things um, about the, the patients that we're serving, but not to connect just to have all the data. Um, I, I've done that before. Uh, one of my jobs was implementing an electronic health record at, at a health system. And um, it, it's, it's, it's uh, unfortunately, if you ask, asking for all the data doesn't help you. So what we want to do is actually get the right information to people at the right time so that they can, with their knowledge, being closer to the people they're serving, make the right decisions and develop the right insights in terms of what we should be focusing on next. Thank you. Um, my last question is around the financial model information that you provided in your slide, and I appreciate that you provided a range of shared savings. Um, one of the questions I, I wanted to ask you is um, understanding that Vermont is a low cap cost Medicare state, meaning our PMPM tends to be lower than much, if not the rest, all of the rest of the country. Um, how do you think that interfaces with the shared savings possibilities and um, your estimates? So this was actually Vermont specific. So we're we're using your. So what you see is Vermont specific. Yeah. I guess my question is, do you see there being as much opportunity in a low cost state than perhaps in a higher cost state where there might be um, more utilization that isn't particularly uh, helpful to the patient. Mm -hmm. You know, I think the, the, I guess the way I've thought about that is, in, you know, if the model was let's let's make sure we document everyone's medical conditions and make sure that our risk adjustment factors are optimized, and uh, I think the answer would be, wow, yeah, no, I think the uh, it would be there'd be less opportunity in a low cost state, uh, either because the, you know, the population is healthier, which in fact, the population of Vermont is overall when you compare it to other states. Um, you know, Hawaii's always up there. I, you know, I always wonder about that, but that's probably a conversation for another board meeting, maybe. Um, but the, uh, um, but the, the other thing is that it, it, you know, the, if it's a if the benchmark is low because it's not a true reflection of how complicated your population is, then then that's that's hard to overcome. The reality for us is that's not our intervention. That's not what we're aiming to do. In fact, there's even limits on how much you can manage uh, your your risk adjustment factor. Now we now we absolutely believe that it's important to have an accurate medical record. Uh, mostly so that we can create the awareness and insights that providers need. Um, but our intervention is actually at the root cause of chronic disease. And that works everywhere. Because um, even in, in, in fact, the state I, uh, so I, I looked up uh, the state of Utah's um, obesity and overweight rate uh, a week and a half ago. And between 1989 and 2018, the only thing it's done is go up. Which means we've we as, as a state in Utah has just gotten sicker and continue to do so. So we're mostly interested on addressing that and doing it at scale and doing it in a way that is in partnership with with the providers in in any area that uh, you know, county or region that we're we have the honor of partnering with, um, so that they can begin to make a difference in in those risk factors that are way upstream of all the, the you know the sick care that takes place after someone actually gets gets those conditions. Is that so? I, I hope that helps. Yeah. Thank you.
uh, I'm all set and I'll pass it to someone else. Thank you, Robin. This is this is Tom Walsh, and I guess I'll um, I'll go next if if that is OK with everyone. Yeah, OK, great. Um, well, thank you, Mark and Mark, and welcome to Vermont. I'm I'm as one board member. I'm glad that you're here. The model of care that you're talking about is something that um, when I was uh, practicing clinician, part of an interdisciplinary spine center, um, you're using some of the same language, you know, and and your language is hinting at some of the things with shared decision making and motivational interviewing and shared medical appointments that we worked on too, and and saw some some success. So I I'm glad you're here, and I want the best for what you're trying to do. Um, a little history about here in Vermont with healthcare transformation and. Um, accountable care. Um, our conversations within the state have often narrowed down to discussions around reimbursement and pricing. And we've some of the time have lost track of of um, assessing quality rigorously and outcomes rigorously. And we're we're starting to try to do more and more of that. We sometimes run into difficulty with benchmarking issues because our state's small. Right, and the the small number with with statistics becomes um, some people some find it problematic. Um, but I was interested in reading through what you sent us um, about your efforts um, to to track for uh, depression screening, and I was wondering if you could just say a little bit more about that, how you how you want to go about that. Yeah, so um, the I'm, I'm really glad you asked that question because this is this actually is a topic that's really important to me. Um, the you know, in when I started in practice back in the mid '90s, uh, we were we were the first primary care practice, the first practice at at the organization I worked at to implement uh, having a behavioral health colleague be part of the practice. So not not a consultant down the hall that you refer to, but actually a team member that that um, that we could partner with to to better care for people. And uh, we ended up ended up rolling that out across the entire system, uh, integrating mental health into into primary care, hugely successful. And um, the way that we will start, um, and 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 understand that there's there there's a lot of things to do, and so it, it, we have to prioritize the work, and we're super focused on actually just getting the the ACO stood up with with the federal programs and and getting our getting our the practices ready. Um, we certainly though. Um, uh, have an overall approach of we want to be aware of how people are doing. Um, and so there's there's a two question, you know, the PHQ2 and the PHQ9 yep. um, that uh, we uh, envision uh, using in the community that people could could fill out and ask, ask the question. But we also believe that there are new things to learn here. There are new things to learn about what does how does a better connection to people, both those that you are that are in your life in person, as well as the community, the community that we're creating across the ACO. You know, how, how do those connections actually have an impact on depression, anxiety, mood disorders, et cetera? And I and I and, and I, I mostly am framing my my thoughts here uh, for those things because uh, obviously, people who suffer from serious and pers persistent mental illness, they need a set of services that that require, uh, you know, psychiatric care and support and, and local services. And, you know, they would certainly be part of a, a high risk group that Mark Atala talked about that 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 we want to be aware of and make sure that our, our clinic partners are aware of them and using every resource they have and every resource that's in the community to care for them. 
the, the, the greater the greater uh, the larger conditions are are mostly around mood disorders and loneliness and so those are the things that we want to identify and then um you know one thing that i learned with with the program decades ago is that that despite all of our wishes that it doesn't it's hard to make to get it to scale because there just aren't enough people out there to care for you know it's like therapists and social workers and psychiatrists and psychologists and so I'm, we're very interested in exploring how to, you know, how does that the community have a, a role to play here, and are there additional partnerships uh, in the coming years? Uh, companies that are innovating in in digital care, and there's many of them out there. It's a little, you know, we have to figure out what, you know, what's working the best. Um, but but we definitely want to review that and potentially partner with companies providing that that type of care so that we can really serve people at scale. I appreciate that, and I, I, um, I'm familiar with the model that you're just des you're describing um, that you used in Utah. And just an interesting piece, we used a similar thing at um, in in New Hampshire. And when we first launched, we were screening for depression. We had a, a behavioral specialist in the hallway with us, like you described. But in those early days. Um, of the people with a positive screen for depression, only about 10% of them were seeing the psychologist. We, it took us three years of work internally to figure out how to use that. Um, and, and so I'm, I'm really glad to hear about um, your, your background with that, because I think um, one of the things that I'd like to see more of in, in Vermont is, um, I'd like to, to see us be able to move to a place where we're more focused on outcomes that matter to patients um, and also um, with an equity mindset that it's mm -hmm. people are pop, it's a popular topic right right around now. But with those things in mind, I think about like to stick with depression, for example, um, I would want to be able to answer a question, what proportion of my patients with depression with a positive screen for depression, actually see a psychologist or participate in the community, right? And, and so then if the, the outcomes for the community effort are improving, depression scores to go down, um, then we know to move more people, try to move more people into that, right? So mm -hmm. it's what proportion of my population have a, a positive screen for depression of those patients, what proportion have seen the care provider? What proportion haven't? What um, what number have ended up in the emergency department or admitted? And terribly, but importantly, what what number have died? Because the ED visits, the inpatient admissions and deaths are numbers that we don't need to benchmark against another location. We can try to bring those towards zero, and if an organization is moving towards zero, then we know that they're progressing. That whatever they're doing is making progress and helpful. And we can, I'd like to be able to um, do that similarly with diabetes. What proportion of my patients with diabetes have an A1C level greater than nine, and haven't been seen in the last six months? They're rising risk patients that are going to end up in your hot spot, right? And so, mm -hmm. um, of those patients, how many in the ED? How many admitted? How many deaths? And over time, moving those numbers towards zero. They'll never get to zero, but that's you know high reliability organizations. That's that's a a goal, right? Zero harm or try, trying to move towards zero. Um, and so, I'd like to see stuff like that. Um, in the future, and I'm I'm saying that to you you all now, like uh, like foreshadowing. Those are the types of things. Hopefully, when you're coming back year over year, at least for the next five, that we'll be able to discuss those types of things and see what you've learned with your commu community outreach. Um, because I hope you're here. We need um, the Vermonters need options, and they they need innovation. And um, I'm thankful for your effort. So. Um, I hope that's helpful. And um, with that, I'll turn it over. Um, I think Dr. Merman is up next. So thank you. Thank you, Tom.
Hi, Mark and Mark, uh, Dave Merman. I'm a new board member. Um, I am an emergency physician, so not the primary care experience that you've had, but just as an aside, I, I too, definitely as a resident in Boston, remember thinking a lot about how could we get this group of people together outside of the clinical environment mm -hmm. to to work together to improve their their health and uh, and share stories and strategies. So I, I, your effort resonates with me in, in many ways there. Um, I just have a few questions. I think actually Tom and Robin brought up um, a lot of issues, or not issues, but questions that I had about your um, application. The, the, so I guess without um, going into uh, confidential information, my my concept of what the community-based component of this is that there's sort of an app with 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 some sort of way to communicate through this app with other people which which um, uh, I would I would you know maybe characterize as social media and I think one of the things that we think about with social media um, sometimes um, is 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 bias and bullying and exclusion and so I guess within these the the community component of your um, efforts how do you um, approach uh, moderating issues like that and be an inclusive uh, community. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, thank you. That's, I, it's a really great question. And it's um, the way there's a couple things that are, are important to do. The first is when you when you join the community, um, there is a series of steps that begin to establish what the community norms are. So um, so when it, so that gets communicated to, to people as they sign up. The the other thing though is to in terms of how we you know put some structure around the conversations, that's in there's some intentionality uh, in in the design there to really focus on the types of things that that Create curiosity that create create the, the and celebrate the ideas of giving and sharing, uh, and this this is of course then leads leads to trust and and the presence of a relationship that's built over time. So, um, we you know that's how that's how we get started and how we then continue to uh, support that. Um, we have the the ability to monitor for um, behaviors that are outside those community norms, and, and I think uh, you know my I, I think through the I guess in my mind I always believe that, and, and I sometimes get teased by my wife by this a little bit, but I, I I always am looking for the good and assuming the good in in people, and so if we see those community norms not being followed, we will have uh, a conversation uh, with them. Uh, it, it might be virtual, but if needed, if needed be, uh, we, we would contact contact them individually. Um, in the community, you're, you're, you're pseudonymous. You, so you have a, a pseudonym that you that is your username, but, um, but you're not completely anonymous. You know, we, we know who, who each individual person is behind the scenes and so we have that ability to have that intervention last thing um uh, i i have zero tolerance for bullying uh, personally and um you know i think that if we've both worked in health systems a long time and we've seen what how bad that is for teams and people and care and so if someone is really stepping outside of the norms and, and crossing a line, then then they, they won't be able to be in the community anymore. So um, we're building out the capabilities to do that at scale. And but I but I would say that the most important thing is really the you know how how we actually are going to interact with each other on a daily basis. We we've had we have a small we have a small community already of people that are are on the platform, and I, I can tell you that people have asked hard questions, and we've had, um, but the community has done a really great job of of 
responding to those questions sometimes and or even addressing maybe some ideas that don't have a lot of evidence behind them um but doing so with curiosity and care and uh trying to understand what's what is any given individual concerned about the most in and asking that question yeah it, it sounds like a really interesting idea i i and i i think it has a lot of potential and excited about it i i do i do still think that as this develops thinking about some of the challenges of how to address things like microaggressions in these communities and yeah. allowing patients an opportunity to identify those um which can in itself be th a, a challenging thing to do um should just be really strongly considered um to try to keep the community diverse and and inclusive i 100 percent agree 100 percent agree thanks that's all i i have for now um chair foster thank you um could you please describe any revenue sources you have beyond um what was described in your slides um, we so in terms of the company overall, we've had s s the initial an initial funding investment that's um, uh, been made, and um, that. Um, but beyond in terms of the uh, revenue for the, the clinical revenues, it is uh, right now it is through AC the ACO is that main source of revenue. Uh, Do you have you know, any uh, operational revenue? Do you have any anticipated non-clinical revenue? Um, it may help to discuss these yeah. in the executive session. Do you have any revenue from pharmaceutical companies? No. Do you anticipate any revenue from any laboratories? No. Do you anticipate monetizing any of the data that you'll be collecting? No. And by you, I mean Gather or any partnerships with Gather, you know, anyone associated with, with Gather, not just Gather itself. Do you anticipate sharing the data or using the data on behalf of any other third parties? Uh, no, no, we, I mean, we are, gov our data privacy is, is, um, very much governed by uh, 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 HIPAA and other privacy regulations, and so that'll all be managed through uh, through business associates agreements and data sharing agreements. Do you anticipate monetizing the data in any way? I get, when you, when you, maybe a clarifying question: uh, When you say monetizing the data, what? Uh, is are you specifically referring to like we would sell the data to somebody for for a price or selling the data or using it on others behalf no i mean it, it we as as we set, as we apply the clinical model and the and the community you know we certainly there's a lot to learn about how these interventions are going to make a difference in people's lives but that learning will be applied to how do we just make the community better and how do we make care better and how do we how do we share the clinical information through because there's an appropriate medical need with our with our care providers that are part of the ACO. Um, I forget what slide number it was, but on the budget and financial model slide, you had projected Vermont beneficiary in kind incentives and shared savings with Vermont providers of 1.495 million. Could you break that out for us in your projection of how much of that is in-kind incentives and how much is shared savings with Vermont providers? Um, yeah. Mark, do we, ha do we have that detail? Um, we, can, we can have it by the executive session. Yeah. I'm going to your submission, page two, question six. It asks about legal actions taken 
Um, I want to broaden that a little bit. Are there any investigations or legal actions potentially threatened or pending relating to the entity, any of the employees, or any of the investors? Uh, there are no legal actions related to the to the entity. Um, you know, specific to employees. I you know, I think that that. Um, I, you know, I, I guess I, I don't know that. I, I mean, I, I don't know that answer in terms of we have 50 different employees, so I, I, I I'm, I'm not sure I, I'm, I know know that answer. We can get that detail for you. Yeah. Um, as, as quickly as possible. I don't, I don't, I don't think we've been, um, we've been attuned to that yet. Okay. Yeah. Sure. To the best of your knowledge, and you, you'd probably have a OIG reporting requirement on that. I would think if there were any actions. Yeah. Um, yeah. And what about the any investors? Um, I think uh, we'll get that. Let me, let, let's go you're, back and you're get asking, that information. I guess I yeah. yeah, yeah just, I'm, just to clarify, okay. what you're asking you're you're asking are there investigations from HHS, OIG, DOJ, or others? Is that what I'm understanding? Correct. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah, I think we can no. answer that question. Yeah. The answer is yeah. no. On all the fronts. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mark. Um, you may have said this, and I might not have totally picked up on it, but could you just describe for us what lifestyle medicine is? Sure. I, I think I get the gist, but I'd appreciate a little bit. Of, yeah, so, uh, so um, I mean, lifestyle medicine is um is a it's a series of of interventions that i think many of us kind of we know um you know things like i should get uh, i i should eat a a diet that consists of of lots of plants um i should not i shouldn't be eating a lot of refined sugar you know um i shouldn't i shouldn't drink excessively um, you know, there, um, I, you know, I should get regular walks. I should try to walk a little bit every hour. Um, and these things have been shared in medicine, usually in the context of you go to your annual exam and, and your provider may have a couple minutes to address that, or maybe you're going to a specialist and, um, and it's, you know, you're going there because of your knee pain and, you know, the, the surgeon or their clinical team may may actually talk a little bit about about addressing some lifestyle things. Um, but they're very hard to adopt. And, and so when, when we talk about lifestyle medicine, our model is we want to create. Create additional knowledge, create support. Uh, for trying some new new things and create the, the awareness of of how those things are actually affecting each and every person's unique metabolism, and so that's that's what lifestyle medicine is. It's it, it really is doing the things that gets to the root cause of disease, as opposed to prescribing another pill or advising for another procedure to be done that really is just treating the condition and the symptom as opposed to the cause. Thank you. That's, that's helpful. Um, on page nine of your submission, the gather submission, it says, quote, we support coordination across the care continuum, comma, which promotes appropriate utilization of care. Um, it continues on. Um, but how do you support care coordination, which promotes appropriate utilization of care? Sure. Well, um, the way that we'll do that is we'll start with by just by creating awareness. And so um, when we've talked, when we talk to providers, a lot of them share that it's sometimes very hard for them to know when their patients are in the ER or when they've been in the hospital. And so, um, you know, what we will be doing is um, providing uh, clinics with uh, that knowledge so that when someone does hit the emergency room, 
um, the team can then engage and uh, reach out to the patient to uh, see what needs there are after their emergency room visit. Or if they didn't know that their patient was transferred from the hospital to a skilled nursing facility, we would make sure they would know that so that they can then activate their care management teams to make sure that they're connecting with that with that care facility or connecting with the patient at home. Doing some of the simple things like just reviewing the medications that they were discharged in and reconciling, um, um, you know, if there are any, if there are any uh, contraindications with some new medicines or making sure that they have a really clear plan. Probably the most important thing is that you've just, you've actually just reached out and made that human to human connection in that transition so that people have an opportunity to ask questions and, and, and kind of, and figure out what the next steps are. So one thing I'm, it might just be me, but how does that promote appropriate utilization of care? It sounds like it's coordinating care, but how does that promote appropriate utilization of care? Yeah, so, well, I think so it, maybe I'll, oh, go ahead. Well, I'll just say that it, it depends on the, on the, on the circumstance there. So there, there are events that happen every day in in the care of a patient that, um, you know, sometimes you're responding to an acute utilization event, um, and uh, I guess what I, in this what I was describing is that when you have have had one of those acute events, it's super important that you begin to connect with that person even more closely uh, from a practice perspective, and it's that. It's that outcome that then leads to the go forward better utilization of care because we've had an, you know, in that follow up to the hospitalization, you now have a modified care plan that reinforces, you know, reach out to the community, reach out to the clinic before you go to the ER if you have a question. And so that that's that's where that more appropriate utilization comes into play. Mark Atala. Yeah, it's that, and I, I think we're also um, aimed at reducing readmissions um, in part through what, what Dr. Priestocker offered. Uh, I'm a pharmacist, so, so largely medication reconciliation is important, uh, and med management post-discharge, which is something we, you know, we, we, we intend to partner with uh, uh, our ACR participant with, um, and, and, and making sure that care plans, especially post-discharge, there's visibility, and then there's, there's assurances of what should Mark be taking now that Mark's out of the hospital? And Mr. Foster, what I'd also add is like one of the quality measures that we'll track is uh, um, unnecessary admissions to the hospital by people who have multiple chronic health conditions. And so that that's another that that'll be a metric that we're that we are are, are following and then providing that information to the providers. So on unplanned admissions is is would be um, is is how that that quality measure is worded. And without getting into the substance of it, I, I you can just answer yes or no. Um, have, have you provided? Have you obtained? legal review of the types of in-kind um, incentives you're providing to patients? Yes, we have. Yeah. And have you already, I thought you referenced somewhere the compliance training. Have you guys already uh, provided training to your employees? We have not oh. done, uh, we have not, oh, Mark, go ahead. No, so we we will um, before the start of the ACO year. Uh, we needed to finalize our our actual application and um, become an ACO with CMS, which happens in December of this year. Um, I don't think I have any other questions for the public portion of the hearing. Um, I'd like to turn it over to the healthcare advocate for any questions or comments that they may have. Thank you, Chair Foster. Um, Good morning still, uh, Mike Fisher, healthcare advocate. I'll have a few questions and then my colleague Sam Peich will have a few questions. Um, 
so first, I think I'll, uh, many board members asked, asked questions in line with questions we had framed up, but um, uh, so some of these will be sort of follow-up questions. Um, my first questions are kind of in line with the questions that um, Member Merman asked earlier about the uh, the app or digital focus of this approach. Um, and so uh, maybe my, my first question is, um, you know, given this population, and its range of abilities and um, uh, and, uh, and not being digital natives. Um, do you think this is, uh, what factor does that play uh, in an online approach yeah. to addressing them? Um, so I think that the, um, it is a factor, but I would say it's a factor for everybody of every age and of every generation. Um, when you think about when the internet uh, was created, um, most, I mean, if people who are 65 to 70 years old today, they they actually were in their, you know, mid, almost, you know, mid-career, like 50, 55 years of age. And so um, when you look at the the data on the use of, of technology by people who are on Medicare, it's it's actually always surprisingly high to people because you have the assumption that it's that it's going to be low. But in fact, uh, a lot of people are able to use it. Um, so the, I think the for us, the most important question is how do we make this as friction free and easy as intuitive as possible so that people who are interested in getting engaged in the platform that that happens in a really, really easy way for them. And uh, I think that our approach, uh, it certainly applies all the best practices uh, that our technology team um, has has experienced over the years um, as they have built this up. And we will learn as we go forward um, as to what makes a difference uh, to to individuals, and I can tell you that our conversations with our provider partners have been really great in this area because they they have given us things that that and and shared ideas um, with us that they have used for many many years in engaging their patients in in different types of initiatives. And just one thing to add, it, it's in our incentives. I mean, the the beauty here is, let's say we didn't exist, so let's say this meeting never happened. You'd have zero beneficiaries. Um, they still have Medicare. They're still in Vermont. You'd have zero beneficiaries that had any of this. And so I think it's helpful to think about the the counterfactual here, which is exactly what SSP or any ACO is intended to do. Which is, if we did if the current status quo, no one's you know talking to anyone. And so I, I think from our end, um, uh, and I came from CMS. I, I'm well aware of of um, opportunities across that population. And I think we're we're working to address that, whether it's uh, financial, whether it's um, digital liter liter uh, literacy, et cetera. And, and we're we're competent, um, we're cognizant of the issue, and hopefully we're we're competent. So appreciate the question. Yeah, I, I appreciate that as well. I I, uh, I I think this line of questioning is more is it apt to work in my mind, um, and um, and and. Um, and I think I'll let go of it, but I, but uh, with a statement because others have made statements. I, I, I just want to recognize that um, that the more time I spend on this thing, the more depressed I am. And we're all spending too much time on this thing. And I think an approach that asks people to spend more time on it, I, I just think we have to be careful of. And, and you, you know, that's more of a comment. You don't have to. If you have a response. No, it's fine. Well, I, I, I'm, I think we're in agreement with that. There's balance to everything. And so uh, we are looking for that balance uh, uh, for sure. I also know that every intervention that we have done to try to address the growth of chronic disease in this country has not changed the trajectory. And so um, we we're this is the next swing at how can we help people feel empowered, have the knowledge, have have the information that they need, uh, and consuming it in a way that works best for them 
to then take those steps to to address risk factors for chronic disease or better manage their chronic disease and do it doing it at scale at a scale that um, just won't be achieved. There just aren't enough primary care providers out there to say, you know, so I've seen plans of, of if we just had everyone get a primary care provider, then this would be fixed. But, but the problem with those plans is there's not enough primary care providers. And uh, and so uh, I, 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 I really, Mr. Fisher, I think it's a great, a great point and one that we, um, we share that concern and also hope that the type of interactions are ones that actually create a different outcome than, than the feelings of depression. And just, sure. just to add too, sorry, I, mean, I think we're not, we're not an ad based company. And so your, your interactions on, I'm guessing your, your phone and social media are, are, are based on ways to get you to engage and. Uh, a lot of algorithms that show you content to, to ensure that you you do respond um, and share. We're, that's not our model. Our model is actually to ensure that you're healthier. Um, and so our, our incentives are actually um, to help you walk rather than help you spend more time uh, clicking on uh, certain articles that are or engaging in discussions that's actually not positive for your health. So I, I think looking at the, the existing social media model and applying that here, we certainly learn from it and we understand it. That's not our, that's certainly not a health model that we're we're adopting or trying to encourage. I was trying to move on from this. Um, I, I, <laughs> no, it's a, good, it's a good question because I think it's it's things that we've thought about and I think it's I mean partly we, we we're happy to engage in that um, and I think it's probably Chair Foster's questions around data and, and we're, we're cognizant of all those things and I, I think we're, we're happy to engage with the board and uh, especially in a executive session if it's helpful. Um, what percentage of your business do you expect to be in Vermont? In, in other words, I've heard the 5,000 estimate for North Star. I think it's just North Star. Uh, how big do you expect the other states to be? So the, um, the our total uh, uh, enrollment is 15,000. So Vermont is one third. OK. Um, can you provide some additional information regarding your leadership structure and compensation for administrators and staff? Yes, yeah, so our leadership structure is I, I'm the executive director. Uh, Mark Atala is quality assurance and compliance. We have a medical director, Dr. Jim LaBelle, and we've got a director uh, of community, uh, uh, Ms. Sarah Taylor. Uh, the in terms of compensation, uh, the the um, I think that if if we'll provide that in executive session. Great, great. That, not surprised that that makes sense. Um, so I know in your narrative, um, your discussion about um, your goal to help overcome barriers to access, and um, and so I guess um, what resources are available to help. Uh, your beneficiaries overcome barriers. So being part of the community, there there are providers that are in the community. And so one of the approach to overcoming barriers is that when you join the community, you're getting you're getting expertise from everyone who's part of it. The um, the, the other thing that I that I know from being in practice is that the when you have patients that are engaged in the plan and engaged in their own health, and um, they they um, they are they're, they're great patients to have. Those are the you know the best families to have, and you you know so I I actually believe that our um, that over time by creating more engagement that 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 the platform will support providers and actually being able to serve more people um on, on a per provider basis now we have to prove that out um uh, to, to see if that would happen but the most important thing is that information that that maybe people th were thinking i need to make a an appointment in clinic for to find out they can now pr get that information themselves through the community or through and through the information that's flowing to them about how how what they're trying is making a difference 
And, and just to add, um, I mean, we have targeted things across the ACO, let's say prescription drug costs, uh, which is a common um, a, a common problem that we, we've seen beneficiaries you know, ask for assistance on. Um, and so I think in, the, in that scenario, when people qualify for extra help, we, we want to make sure, A, that they're aware that that exists, B, what the process is to access that, and then C, you know, where essentially then they would then qualify. So so as they choose plans year over year, uh, you know, ensuring that they're aware of how their entitlement and how their benefit of Medi their Medicare benefit you know, really is something that they can access. I think from the state perspective, if someone qualifies for Medicaid, I you know I, I hope that you know we'd love to work with you to understand you know how how patients that do qualify for Medicaid um, could access Medicaid. And so I think those are you know gaps from an access perspective. That we're you know interested in, in, in advocating for uh, in partnership with you. Well, so th thanks, Mr. Attila. That's that that's a, that's exactly where I was going. Um, um, a, as you um, as you look at the population of of uh, patients at um, North Star who are on traditional Medicare, have you um, evaluated how many of them have secondary coverage? Yeah, so I mean, whether it's Medicaid or whether it's a Medigap or Medicare supplemental program, so we we don't have the patients yet. So I I think one question, you know, I think some of this is a timing issue, right? So we don't um, we 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 will not have an assessment uh, of those patients um, before really January, frankly. So the the way it works in general is we don't sign a contract with CMS or any kind of data until uh, December. So, um, but but I mean, keep again, keep in mind that this is a we are incented to do the things that would help the set of beneficiaries. And so I think from that end, uh, whether it's a Medigap plan or whether it's Medicaid, we'd, we'd like to ensure that the right the right choice of care is is, is an option for people. But it's something we're looking for. Yeah. I, I, all right. I, I think my point is probably well made. Uh, for those folks with no secondary coverage, um, um, it may look like a lack of engagement to the provider and and actually be uh, an inability to follow uh, the provider's recommendation. That's what we see. Yeah. And uh, and any kind of discussion about patients as as uh, you know not being engaged or not uh, um, uh, or somehow not being invested in following the recommendations of providers without an evaluation of that, I think um, from my perspective is often um, not appreciating what is really going on in their lives. And who's the right office if we identify the set of patients, you know, may qualify for Medicaid? Is that working with you? Like, what's the right approach there? I'd be happy to, to make it real. Talk, yeah. talk, talk in the future about, you know, uh, uh, sure. uh, being of service to, uh, you know, we are of service to all of our monitors, but we should have that conversation afterward. Um, Sam, why don't you go ahead? Thank you. Thank you for your answers. Thank you. Thanks. Good morning, still. Uh, Sam Push, Health Policy Analyst, also with the Healthcare Advocate. Um, following up on a question that Chair Foster raised regarding your approach being rooted in lifestyle medicine, I just wanted to ask you to respond a bit to a concern or critique of lifestyle medicine in that it might not fully acknowledge or address the role of structural factors like discrimination, poverty, lack of stable housing. As I, I think it's our view that those factors fall outside or are not completely explained by you know behavioral choice so i'm just wondering if you could respond to that maybe can yeah. i just I don't know, mark you may have an answer go ahead mark i mean just to clarify what i mean what is the is the point that um there are other structural there are other parts of someone's life that may affect their ability to to execute on lifestyle changes or Maybe I can maybe clarify what you would like the, the problem and then like that maybe get a question for me. Sure. I mean, I think what I, what I hear a lot, kind of a, a theme throughout this is it's helping people to make better choices. And I think sure. um, there are factors that limit folks' ability to make that choice. And we're not always as a as a public and a collective, not always empowered um, 
to have the agency to do that and that there are things holding people back that are outside of their individual control or capacity. So I'm wondering yeah, like how you address that issue um, or if that's a part of your model. So I think this is I think this is why the partnership with with each provider in the community is so important. So you're you're now getting to the knowledge that that you know that a each clinical team and their provider and their care management staff and social workers uh, it's really impo important for them to know what's what's going on from a social determinants perspective and it's why in our model we we really prioritize and 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 believe in uh, providing information and resources not in the form of it's a specific program and you must do x y and z and then this happens but provide the resource to the to the people that that have the the most knowledge to then use them in the right way to serve people in the best way and to address their most important thing. Um, if you yeah. are not if you are not sure if you can afford groceries, then and and you're having pressure with whether it's food insecurity or housing insecurity or economic insecurity. Your ability to 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 try a new idea is is really limited by the fact that you have these other things. So, I think I think part and parcel with Mr. Fisher's comments, um, it's going to be super important that we make sure that that this type of evaluation is taking place with clinical teams, and to the extent that we can provide that information, or maybe provide data that provides insights into this this group this particular patient might be experiencing something new so that you can there be, can be some outreach that's that's what we would want to empower yeah i think even just bringing back to the community um you know i think in today's world uh, i would be interested in knowing how in vermont you know let's say i did have this issue you know where do i turn and is, is there a group of people that i can already access to ask that question to you know other than the social workers or going back to the system and so I think that's what we're trying to enable, frankly. And so I, I, you know, I, I think to think about it as, you know, you only have a limited set of social workers and other others in your community. Um, and I think to the extent that the communities and others that have gone through this or know someone that's gone through this, um, you know, may have a better suggestion on how, how to address, you know, any of the social determinants mentioned. Um, we think is we think is a valuable uh, part to bring. Thank you. Appreciate it. That's that's helpful. Um, we talked a bit earlier about shared medical appointments, and I imagine this is probably a new care model for a lot of many, many Vermonters. So I'm wondering if you, it seems like this platform is going to be online. Um, so I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit more about that model and how patient confidentiality is maintained um, and how you get buy in from folks to do that. Yeah, so yeah. within the model, if we if. if if there is an instance where um, someone would wants to have a a one on one conversation with with a provider, so let's say that there's someone says, "Hey, I'd love to talk to a dietitian about some things that I could do." Um, you know, we, we could we would facilitate that either number one by uh, talking with our partner, the clinics who are in in the community to see if they want to reach out and, and provide that resource. Or they could get connected to a private one on one conversation with a dietitian who's in the community. Okay, thank you. That's helpful. Um, in the narrative, you also talked about engaging patients in culturally competent ways and coordinating solutions to overcome any barriers to access. I'm just wondering if you could concretize that or talk a yeah. bit more about how that operates in practice. Thanks. Yeah, I think this is really this this actually has been really informed by our early work with a federally qualified health center in um, in another county. And one of the things that we realized is that there are um, I mean, there are just some things from a culture perspective that that even as a provider that if if I if I work to understood, I still would not ever have the same level of empathy and understanding as someone who is like that person in the community. And and so um, 
it, it was really and, and this is this is these are stories only uh, from our, from our early work, but it was really it was really gratifying to see how a you know a person who is illiterate and where that and they don't speak English and they are undocumented yet they get and they have a chronic condition and yet, and yet by being on the platform and by being able to have access to information and others who could ask answer their questions that that made a difference for them and so um i think I'm excited about this because I, I I just don't believe that as a primary care provider I would I you know even with awareness I still would never be able to to have that same level of expertise and empathy and understanding to respond to someone who is in in the in the circumstance that's similar to what they are experiencing and that and so in that mind the community does become uh, a, a provider that is more culturally empathic and competent. Does your group do any type of trainings for implicit bias, improving cultural competency, that sort of thing, or plan to do that when you come online? Yeah, so, yeah, so I mean, our, our providers, um, you know, we're across multiple states. So I, I think from the ACO's perspective, specifically with how we interact with our beneficiaries, you know, we ensure it's, it's uh, language, you know, is a big deal for us, uh, you know, ensuring that there's um, multiple languages, not just English and Spanish. Um, beyond that, I think, I think the, uh, the concept of implicit bias or others, um, you know, th these are operating practices that see patients daily. Uh, we we defer to them. I think you know a big part of Medicare in general is that um, physicians and providers practice, uh, and not you know the regulator. And so in our case, we're regulated by CMS. Um, uh, and so in in, in that view, um, it's up to them really to ensure that their their, their care models are. Um, are trained to to identify implicit bias and address them. Um, we we do the things that we can control, and that others <laughs> handle the parts they can control. Okay. Um, this is my last question, at least for this session. We, we may have questions during the executive, but I'm wondering if you could provide a little more detail for folks that, for beneficiaries that live. I mean, Vermont is a state where not everyone has regular wireless internet has self-service, you know, it's a very rural state by and large. And I'm wondering what accommodations you make for folks that might be in that situation and for folks that have disabilities or other access issues, what accommodations you make um, for integrating with your model. Yeah, so we, we've thought a lot about that um, because we, we recognize the population we're treating and, you know, similar to how I um, we answered Mr. Fisher's question. Um, we will have pathways beyond just the um, beyond just the app to ensure that people that that need access um, to these incentives and to the to this care that's not covered through Medicare uh, get access to that. And that that main point of of, of access is through um, is through the uh, through the provider. And so when we talk through in the narrative about our partnership with our provider. Um, it's critical, right? So the, the point right now, none of the beneficiaries know who we are, and likely they will not know who we are, um, you know, throughout throughout the year. They know who their provider is, though. And so I think where 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 our point of of uh, of care comes in is is as at the provider office, and to the extent that um, you know people adopt the community and people uh, join together and 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 you know really see the value in, in connecting with each other and others, um, that's our that's our view. Hopefully that helps how we thought about it. Thank you. I'll turn it back to you, Chair Foster. Thank you. Um, at this time, I'd like to turn it over to public comment. Um, and uh, folks could use the um, raise your hand function. I'll try and call on you in the order in which your hand is raised if there are any questions or comments. Okay, uh, there seems to be no public comment today. And with that, um, if there is a motion to move to the executive session, um, please let me know. I will make said motion. Um, 
I move that we go into executive session to consider the portions of Gather Health's budget submission relating to the terms of the ACO agreements with its providers that are exempt from access to public records provisions of the Public Records Act. And is there a second? Second. And all those in favor of moving to an executive session, please say aye. 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 And any uh, opposed, please say nay. And the board has voted unanimously to move to an executive session to discuss the confidential portions of Gather's submission. Mr. McCracken, is there anything else that we need to address? Uh, no, I don't think so. There has been a separate invite circulated to board members, relevant staff, Gather Health, uh, and the healthcare advocate. Um, so what we'll do is we'll sign off of this meeting and sign on to that second uh, executive session meeting. Russ, I have a quick question. In prior uh, hearings, we've identified the people who should go into executive session, um, specifically board members, ACO staff, the healthcare advocate. Uh, I don't know if that's required, but I just thought I'd raise it. Um, yeah, I think that that is useful. So the executive session will be uh, the four board members who are present here today. Um, uh, Mr. Atala, uh, Dr. Uh, Brasicker from Gather Health, uh, your attorney, uh, Mr. C, um, would be myself and perhaps um, our general counsel, and ACO staff will be um, Marissa, Julia, uh, uh, apologies if there are other a board ACO staff that I've failed to mention, uh, 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 and the uh, healthcare advocate, uh, Mr. Peich, uh, Mr. Fisher, um, and uh, of course, Susan Barrett. Um, so he's welcome to join us all. And lastly, uh, we, we will have a court reporter over in the executive session. It's a separate transcript that is kept confidential. Great, thank you. Um, so at this time, there is a login link for those who are permitted to participate in the executive session, and we should move on over there. And when that's completed, um, just for others, we will come back to this session and wrap up the board meeting. Thank you. Hi, Maggie. Uh, are you all set or are you waiting for backup? No, I'm all set. Okay. Uh, okay, we can go back on the record. On the record. Thank you. Um, are there any additional um, comments or questions uh, for the gather folks? Great. Um, well, thank you both for your time and answering all of our questions. You're very thorough and we, we appreciate it very, very much. And um, we're excited that you're interested in Vermont. It's a great state. Uh, and we hope that you have a lot of success here. Um, at this point, I'd like to ask if there's any old business to come before the board. Is there any new business to come before the board? And is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, the motion carries and the meeting is adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>